Well, let's see. We're just at about 12 o'clock right now. So, uh, yeah, got a good number of folks joining us. I like that, Arlene. Yeah, get some bird song, something nice from the gardens. So make it make it feel like we could be there in person right now to enjoy Lynn's talk. I like that idea. We'll get something going for the next one. Um, but yeah, so there are still some people coming in, but I want to get started here because I want to make sure we give Lynn as much time um, as possible. She's got a lot of great stuff to share with everyone today. Um, so again, welcome everybody who's joining us to our latest virtual lunchbox talk. Um, today, we're joined by Lynn Richardson, who's going to be talking about biodiversity beginning at home. Um, we're just so pleased that uh, we're able to put these on for everyone. We miss everyone. We miss our community. Um, it's a shame that we can't be at the gardens, um, but we thank y'all for understanding uh, this really unique uh, situation that we've got right now. Um, so again, welcome to our virtual Unbox talk. Just a quick reminder um, for those who have not joined us before, this virtual Lunchbox talk is a Zoom webinar, which means that you will not be able to have video or audio on, and we'll do some Zoom housekeeping here very shortly. Um, and just a little quick plug for our next event as well. We're continuing to do these virtual Lunchbox talks, and our next event is going to be on June 25th, um, which is in a few Thursdays, and that's going to be a conversation with Dr. David Michener uh, from the University of Michigan and some of his community partners to discuss tribal um, and university perspectives at two botanic gardens. So hopefully y'all can join us for that one as well. But we are going to get started here. First of all, uh, moderating today is myself, the public programs coordinator. My name is Ben um, and Joanna is here as well. Um, our director of education. She'll be kind of in the background here helping make sure all the tech goes smoothly and helping to answer questions and putting some stuff in the chat box for us. Um, there's a lot of nice links that Joanna's putting in right now. So y'all can click on those and save those um, just so you have them to our website to future events that we've got. So now everyone's favorite, a little Zoom housekeeping. Again, sorry for folks who are Zoom experts by now um, during this time of pandemic, but I uh, just wanted to go over a few things. Like I said, this is a webinar, um, a little bit different than a regular Zoom meeting. So your audio and video will be muted um, by default. Now, if you click on the little menu in the bottom, you'll be able to adjust your audio settings. Hopefully everyone can hear me just fine. Um, but if you click down there, you can change your, your speakers. If you have multiple things, make sure your headphones are working um, and all of that. Uh, at below too, you'll see a chat button. Um, this allows you to interact with other attendees and the panelists. Just be aware that if you are trying to talk to another pan or another attendee, um, the panelists see all the chat. Um, so we may ask you some poll questions today. Lynn's got a few poll questions and we're going to start off one here in a moment. Um, and if there's an other category, we might ask you to, to chat in um, and type in an answer there just so we can, can better understand what's going on. Um, nice way to answer questions as well. If you have technical support or if something's not working, feel free to put it in the chat. The other way to interact with us during the webinar is going to be the raise hand feature. Um, this is kind of fun. You raise your virtual hand and that way we know that uh, something might be going on. Um, this is mainly an accessibility feature for folks who don't feel comfortable typing um, or maybe don't have the ability to type your question in. We're going to take some pauses during this webinar so Lynn can address some questions. Um, so if you want to ask one live, if you don't feel comfortable typing, you can also raise your hand and then the moderators will get to you there. Now this Q&A button at the bottom, this is going to be your main way to interact and type in your questions that you have for Lynn. Feel free to use this at any point during the webinar. Um, we've got some breaks kind of built into Lynn's presentation where we can ask these questions, but if something pops into your head that you want to ask Lynn, uh, feel free to type it in the Q&A and I will try to moderate those and get to all of them um, as soon as we can. Um, so keep the questions coming. It's a great way to interact uh, with our speaker today. Uh, so before, let's see, before I introduce our speaker here, I want to just, we're going to try this polling feature out. I want to get a good sense of actually who is joining us and where y'all are coming from. 
So I'm going to launch our first poll. So on your screen, you should see a question about where are you joining us from? And you can click on the little radio button and let us know. If you're not coming from the Triangle region of North Carolina, feel free to hop into the chat and let us know where you are joining us from. Always nice to see where everyone's coming from. So it looks like we have some people who aren't in the Triangle. So if you're not in the Triangle, feel free to open that chat button. There we go. We've got Carol joining us from Charlotte. That's great. Let's see, some people are having trouble seeing the poll. Awesome. Austin coming from DC. Pat in Atlanta. Alex from Maryland. It's fantastic. Got people from all over joining us here. So we've got about 92% of people voted. So I'm going to end the poll and share these results with y'all. So here you can see we've got about 88% of the people joining us from the triangle, 12% coming from different areas like we just talked about. So that is really great. Appreciate everyone taking, taking time today to join us and join Lynn. Um, yeah, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker today. Uh, we're going to be talking about biodiversity begins at home um, with Lynn Richardson. And Lynn Richardson has been an advocate for environmental causes since joining her Wadesboro, North Carolina High School's Friends of the Earth chapter in the early 1970s. She graduated from UNC Chapel Hill with a degree in English and went on to receive a master's in library and information science. She retired in 2016 as the head of Durham County Library's North Carolina collection, where she received the Order of the Longleaf Pine for her work to preserve Durham history. She's an active member of the New Hope Audubon Society's Bird Friendly Habitat Committee and a longtime supporter of the Nature Conservancy, Triangle Lane Conservancy, and other environmental organizations. A strong interest in native plants and the problem of invasive plants led to the June 2019 co-founding of her South Durham neighborhood's eco-friendly landscape committee, of which she is vice chair. She is thrilled to be talking about her work on this committee as part of her capstone project for the North Carolina Botanical Gardens Native Plant Studies Program. So with that, we're so pleased to have, have you here, Lynn. We're really excited um, to hear everything that you've got to say. Um, and yeah, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and we'll let uh, and we'll let Lynn take it from here. We good? We are great. Thanks, Lynn. All right, um, I am delighted to be here today to talk with you about this uh, project in my neighborhood, Woodcroft, which is in um, southeast, I'm sorry, southwest Durham. I do know where I live. Um, I'm trying to get my screen set up here, so it'll take me just a sec. Um, okay. Well, Woodcroft, my neighborhood, has been hailed, or was hailed when it was developed in the mid-1980s for its smaller lot sizes, um, the extensive system of trails, and um, the focus on preservation of trees. In fact, um, the covenants uh, that were developed at the time uh, the community was founded uh, include the mandate to protect, maintain, and enhance the conservation of the neighborhood's natural and scenic resources. And I joined with another resident, Leslie Fiddler, last year um, in asking the board to live up to that statement uh, beyond just protection of trees. Um, so that's how this project began. Uh, so Woodcroft, um, as far as I know, is the only community in Orange or Durham County, uh, the only homeowners association that has taken on this kind of project. If anybody knows differently, I'd, I'd be really interested to hear about that. Um, so I'm really proud of my neighborhood for, um, for stepping up and doing this important work. And um, I know the audience today runs the gamut from people who know all about invasive plants and native plants um, to people who, who are just beginning in this and don't know a whole lot. So the first thing I'm gonna do um, is talk about uh, some basic concepts. So we'll all kind of be on the same page. 
So what are native plants? Well, native plants um, evolved naturally over thousands of years um, in a, a particular region or ecosystem. You can think of our North American plants as ones that were here um, when Columbus landed. They weren't brought in later. Um, and so why, um, why are native plants important? Well, they're important for a lot of reasons. They feed birds and other wildlife. They provide nectar um, for the pollinators we all depend on. And um, one out of every three bites of, of food humans take is made possible uh, by pollinators. So that's, that's pretty important to us. Uh, they improve the quality of our woodlands, air, and water. Um, they help slow climate change and they provide optimal habitat for insects, which are absolutely crucial to life on Earth. And we're gonna talk more about that in just, um, in just a minute. All right, so what are invasive plants? Well, invasive plants are non-native species that displace native plant communities. And um, here we've got the poster child invasive for uh, the south on the right of kudzu, although there, there are many that are a lot worse, uh, or a good many that are a lot worse than kudzu. But since Europeans uh, be began colonizing North America, thousands of plants have been introduced. A lot of those have been introduced deliberately, most of them, by the landscape trade. Some have come in accidentally. Uh, Japanese stiltgrass, which is the bane of a lot of our existences, uh, I think came in in packing material that used, was used for porcelain from China in the uh, early 1900s. Well, some of these plants that have been introduced um, to the United States are spreading out of control. Uh, these are aggressive plants. They're highly adaptable and they're just able to out compete um, other plants for resources. And these are some of the uh, most common, we've got plenty more, but these are some of the most common plants um, in my neighborhood in Woodcroft. We've got winter creeper on the left, Chinese privet, autumn olive, and I will say that autumn olive is so invasive, it's such a problem that it's been banned in eight central and eastern states of this country. It's just a, a rampant invasive. And then we've got English ivy um, on the right. Well, this, this talk is about biodiversity. So um, what exactly is biodiversity and, and, and why does it matter? Well, biodiversity is the variety of life on Earth in all its forms and all its interactions. And um, this definition includes not only the tremendous number of different species on Earth, but also the variation in the genes of individual species and the diversity within populations. So if you think of, say, a northern red oak, uh, You've got one in New York State, you've got the same species in North Carolina. The one in New York State may have uh, be genetically somewhat different because it's, it's lived its life in a much colder climate, climate and has had uh, to adapt to that. And this ability to adapt and continue to evolve is, is what actually allows plants to continue to exist. Um, and loss of biodiversity is right up there with climate change as a threat to our planet. Um, estimates vary, but um, we know that a large number of plant and animal species on Earth now face extinction. I've read in several places the estimates of as much as 50% by the end of this century. Well, the um, air you breathe, the water you drink, the food you eat, all ultimately rely on maintaining biodiversity. Every time we lose a species, the planet is a little less resilient, a little less able to provide the ecosystem services that we need. Well, how do native inv and invasive plants um, affect biodiversity? Well, to talk about this, we've got to talk about bugs. And um, for those of you out there who have just gone, you, and roaches, mosquitoes, and ticks come to mind. Let me tell you that a few insects have given 
the rest of the insect world a really bad, a really bad rap. Um, 99 plus percent of insects are beneficial or neutral. There are very few that, that are a huge problem. And actually human beings would only last just a few months if, if insects were to disappear. Uh, the renowned biologist E.O. Wilson calls them the little things that run the world. And unfortunately, in the past 40 years, insects have actually declined by uh, 50%. Well, why are insects so important? Um, well, they pollinate 90 about 90% of all plants that perform a number of very crucial functions, including providing food for us and other creatures. They also provide much of the planet's pest control. They quickly decompose dead plants, releasing uh, the nutrients that new plants need to grow. They feed a lot of uh, other creatures, including birds, fish, bats, dragonflies, who happen to eat a lot of mosquitoes. Um, and they basically sustain the Earth's ecosystems by sustaining the plants and animals that run those ecosystems. Okay, now, so what do insects have to do with native plants and invasive plants? And this is the kicker, folks. This is, this is an important point. 90% of insects can complete their life cycle only on the native plants they evolved with. And I'm, I'm gonna say that one more time to you. 90% of insects, almost all, can complete their life cycle only on the native plants that they evolved with. So on the screen here, you see the uh, monarch butterfly caterpillar on the milkweed, and, and probably most of you know, no milkweed, no monarch butterflies. Well, that's true for lots of other insects as well. So when we allow invasive plants to overrun native plants in woodlands, when we remove native plants as we develop and in our yards and that kind of thing and replace them with non-native plants, we, we, act, we are destroying what, the, uh, what insects need to make um, the world habitable. Well, why can't parks um, and other public lands um, take over this, this role of providing uh, native plants for us? Well, I think you can, can see a lot from just looking at this graphic. We're heavily developed and 86% of the land in the Eastern United States is privately owned. Um, so there's not enough public land to take over this function. So places like Woodcroft uh, need to do their part if we're gonna continue to have uh, the biodiversity that we need. So the bottom line is invasive species are second only to habitat loss in causing the decline in the world's biodiversity. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard about the biodiversity crisis in the Amazon. Well, I can tell you it's also happening right here, right in our own backyards. So we can't afford to believe any longer that we're gonna have enough air, uh, clean air, water, and other critical resources, regardless of how we treat our landscapes. Um, to survive, nature can't be somewhere else, you know, sort of not, not in my backyard. And um, technological fixes just aren't gonna do the job. They're not a substitute. And at this point, um, about half of the US population live in suburbs like Woodcroft. Um, so if we can remove our invasive plants and protect our native plants on common lands here, if we can encourage um, neighborhood residents to remove their invasive plants and increase their planting of natives in their yards, we're going to create so much more habitat. Uh, Doug Tallamy calls it homegrown national park. And this is going to be the best way to restore biological functions to um, our neighborhood and other neighborhoods. And I think Ben's going to jump in now with a poll. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. So we are going to start our next poll here. So I'm going to launch that right now. So y'all should see up here. So the question here is, which of the following best describes your neighborhood? Just let us know here, and I'll give I'll give folks a few seconds here to to vote. 
got about 50% of the vote in, and then I'll share the results with everyone, so everyone should be able to see. All right. Excellent. Do about 15 more seconds. If everyone could vote, that would be wonderful. All right. Few more seconds here. We've got about 90% of the votes in. All right, so with that, we're gonna end this. I'm gonna share it so y'all should be able to see. So here it looks like 38% of the folks have an HOA with about 17% a neighborhood association and about 45% having neither. All right, thank y'all for voting, I appreciate that. And uh, again, remember if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A and we'll get to those uh, later in the presentation. So I'll hand it back over to Lynn. Okay, great. So over half of you either have a neighborhood association or a homeowners association. So that, um, I hope you'll think about as we go through what's been done in Woodcroft, how you can do similar, um, similar things in your neighborhood. So the Woodcroft neighborhood has over 2,000 homes. We've got over seven miles of walking trails and 209 acres um, of mostly wooded common land. And that common land is divided into um, about 100 acres or under Woodcroft Community Association jurisdiction. <coughs> Excuse me. And the other 109 acres <coughs> um, are under the jurisdiction of sub HOAs in the community. Um, and before I get into the meat of what has happened specifically in Woodcroft, I just want to show you some of the really cool things that we have to protect. Marbled salamander, spring beauty, early spring wildflower, morel mushroom, possums, and I want to put in a plug for possums. Those of you who don't know, um, possums eat hundreds of ticks a day. So, so these little guys are your friends. Um, I saw a mom with babies just like this in my backyard just a few weeks ago. Then we've got viburnum raffinescianum, uh, tree frog, uh, trout lily, our earliest spring wildflower, um, buckeye. I can't see my screen to see what I've got over here. Okay, stinkhorn. Somebody tried to get me to stomp on that and I politely <laughs> declined. <laughs> I think the name says it all. Um, snapping turtle, dragonfly, pileated woodpecker, uh, cro cross vine flowers, lizard tail, uh, zebra swallowtail uh, butterfly and red-shouldered hawk. So, and, and this is just a sampling of, of, of the wonderful creatures and plants that live uh, in our neighborhood. Well, this is the Woodcroft board. Uh, Tracy Harrell on the left is our president, Scott Carter, Conrad Carter, and uh, Mike Fisher. And um, the board could see the problems with English Ivy, every time they rode down the main um, road, Woodcroft Parkway, through our neighborhood, because it's in, uh, coming into the areas along the trails along the parkway. And then if, if the board is walking our trails, they, they would also see it. So it was not a big leap for them to grasp that it, Ivy wasn't the only invasive plant problem. And they gave permission to Leslie and me to start this committee um, to deal with these problems. So the first meeting was in June of 2019, a year ago. Uh, we had nine people and decided to name the committee uh, the Woodcroft Eco-Friendly Landscape Committee. Um, our mission, uh, which I read actually at the beginning, but I'm just going to go over it again. Whoops, sorry is um, taken from our covenants, and that is uh, to protect, maintain, and enhance the conservation of natural and scenic resources. We are trying to um, fully live up to that mission. So the, um, golly, sorry. 
So we've got a committee. Well, a committee needs a plan. We got to know where we're headed. So we developed a five-year plan um, with four goals. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through each goal um, and talk about what we've accomplished in the past year under each of those goals. So uh, goal one is to remove intentionally planted invasive species on Woodcroft uh, maintain rights of way and common lands. And intentionally planted means things that were selected as part of the landscape. Uh, landscaping not accidentally made their way in. And before I go on to tell you about what we've accomplished under this goal, I want to show you two graphics on plant selection from Doug Tallamy. Um, I mentioned him earlier. Um, not only are the graphics from him, he, uh, a lot of the information in the first part of this talk is information that I got out of two of his books, which are in the credits, you can, can find them. Um, he's in the uh, professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. And he's been a big influence, not only on me, but on the Audubon Bird Friendly Habitat Committee I'm, I'm part of, and probably a lot of you uh, as well. So, so thanks to Doug for, for the incredible work that he is doing. So this is our past criteria for how we choose plants for a landscape. And you can see it's, it's decorative value. Uh, we want it to be pretty. Well, when we choose only on the basis of decorative value, we are essentially equating landscaping with um, ecological destruction. So hopefully our future criteria will be a lot more balanced and we'll have decorative value. You know, we all love beautiful plants and there's nothing wrong with that. And a lot of native plants are beautiful too, so we need to keep that in mind. Um, but we also wanna do things that help the environment like support food webs. So for um, the, the accomplishment under this first goal was to do an inventory of invasive plants that were used in the common area landscaping along the Woodcroft Parkway. And uh, so now in the future, when these areas are redone, uh, we'll know immediately what's there that's invasive and hopefully get those taken out, those plants taken out. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of examples of this. Uh, you can see winter creeper, on the left and some Nandina in the background, Chinese silver grass and uh, burning bush. And then another area has a lot of liriope that's galloping around and seed mount and um, Nandina and Japanese privet. And then our second goal um, is to remove unintentionally planted invasive plants from our common land. And this means the ones that, you know, the birds have eaten the fruit of an invasive plant, pooped it out somewhere in, on our common land and it took root, or we had a big rainstorm, an invasive vine or something from somebody's yard washed onto a common area spot and, and, and took root. So, so that's, that's what that's about. And Leslie Fiddler, who is in the front here, uh, center photograph, um, organized what was called um, the Ivy League, very cool name. And this was a group of volunteers uh, who got together to do several invasive plant removal work days. You can see microstegium, uh, Japanese stiltgrass being removed on the left, and Chinese privet on the right. And as Leslie herself says, this. This was theater. I mean, um, they had fun, they did good work, but it's just not possible with a few volunteers to tackle 100 acres of Woodcroft Community Association land, Community Association land. So, um, I approached the board and asked for funds to do a pilot project to start re uh, removing these invasive plants. The board agreed and um, allotted funds for this. So, and I do think that that, uh, well, anyway, so we're getting, uh, you've got to prepare for treatment. We've got T.R. O'Neill here on the right. He is a fabulous Woodcroft Community Association manager, and he 
marked the property lines for the uh, pilot project areas because you know we've we can't encroach onto private property that's needed to be done on Woodcroft Common Land. And he's got board member Mike Fisher and his, and his sidekick helping, helping out over there. Um, another thing that we did was I developed a flyer, um, a notice to go to homeowners so they know what was going on. Um, these are people who live near the areas that were gonna be um, treated. So this has things like why remove these plants, how to remove them, who to call if you have questions, a list of the common invasive plants in Woodcroft and some tips on how to prevent these plants from spreading. And then the other thing, of course, we had to do was find a company to do the treatment and uh, develop a plan for working with them. And I'm gonna show you now, um, I picked three areas that had typical types of invasion that are found um, in Woodcroft. Um, the first one is a lowland area along Third Fork Creek, and you can see this is overrun with Chinese privet. And here's some people from the Trius, the company that we chose, uh, doing some uh, treatment of, um, of the Chinese privet. Then the uh, an, another type of area we chose was patches of English ivy that had escaped from people's yards and were getting into the common land that's along the trails along Woodcroft Parkway. We thought this would be really visible. People could, you know, who lived in the neighborhood could see the work that was being done and, and see, uh, you know, see what a difference it made. And then finally, this is an area off of a trail out down in the woods. Um, it's hilly, it slopes down to a creek. And a real grab bag. It had liriope, mimosa, thorny olive, uh, English ivy, some Chinese privet, other, and, and other, a, a real mixture. And then I developed, um, you know, we needed to keep track of what we were doing. We need for, you know, for future reference. So I developed a, a spreadsheet and it includes things like what are the target plants? What type of treatment was used? Uh, percent of herbicide used? Uh, how much, you know, a pint, a gallon? How many hours it took? The temperature, because of course the temperature affects how well the herbicide uh, works. And, uh, so things like that on this spreadsheet. And I feel like we really made a good start on this major goal, which I do feel is the most important work that has been done by this committee um, since it was founded. My big frustration is that, you know, garden shops are still selling these invasive plants. People are buying them, they're putting them in their yards. People that already have them in their yards aren't necessarily removing them and, and the spread continues. I feel like all these plants need to come with a warning label uh, saying, exactly what kind of um, havoc people are, are wreaking when they, when they plant them. So I think we're gonna stop now um, and I'll, I'll take some questions. That's great, thank you so much, Lynn. I uh, got a number of questions coming through. Um, we'll start off with one that says, you may be planning to address this later, but did you encounter any objections to the removal of the intentionally planted invasives uh, within the community and how did you overcome those objections? Well, we haven't actually started removing those yet. I did that inventory so that when those beds are redone, it'll be clear what's invasive. Um, I, there, but I haven't had any people be concerned about, uh, I don't think people will be concerned with replacing them something appropriate for the beds. Great. Thanks, Lynn. Um, just a quick question. Is Woodcroft an HOA or a neighborhood association? It's an HOA. All right, beauty. Thank you, Lynn. Um, let's see, Bob is asking, that they're retrying, they, they are trying to remove, excuse my pronunciation, Alanthus trees, poison ivy, and privet from some trails that they have through eight acres of forest on their community retirement center campus. 
Uh, is it possible to remove those without the use of herbicides? Do you know? I, I, will, I will say now and I will say later, once things get pretty big, unless you're willing to, and I, you know, I'm not an expert remover, but I've, I've been gardening on this land I'm sitting on right now for 25 years. And, and um, once things get that big, you're almost gonna ha have to use herbicides. I suppose you could hook, uh, you know, a truck or a tractor up to, you know, pull them out by the roots. There may be other ways, but I don't think those are particularly feasible. I think the good news is once you remove, you know, once you do your initial removal, um, which is hard work, there's no doubt. But then if you stay on top of that, you know, I, in my yard, I'm on my two thirds of an acre and the little patch of common land next to, to me and behind me often, you know, I mean, I, on my yard all the time and on the common land, I would try to walk it every six months to a year. And when things are six inches tall or even a foot tall, I, you know, I can yank a privet out with no problem. So once you do that initial work, then it's just a matter of walking your land periodically and um, keeping up with the new ones that are coming in. Great, thanks. Lynn. I like this question coming in from Molly. My neighbors would freak out about herbicides. What would you tell them? <laughs> well, I would tell them to watch this talk. <laughs> um, it'll be on YouTube. You know, it is, it is not, it's a complex issue. And I think you, you know, I, I don't like herbicides either. We'll t I'll talk about that a little later. Um, I do feel this is the one big area where we have to use them. And, you know, it's either, I mean, if you're out in the woods at all, you know that these plants are multiplying minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, and taking over a lot of woodlands. And if it's the, for me personally, and I think for a lot of people who think about this issue, um, it's, it's more important to use those herbicides and have biodiversity than not use herbicides and trash, trash our entire ecosystems. Excellent, I appreciate it. So we've got a lot of questions coming in. I think though we're gonna, we're, we'll take a pause and I'll read through these because I think some of them might be addressed here later in Lynn's talk. Okay. Um, Cause I wanna make sure that we have enough time for, for Lynn to get through. Um, um, some other things here. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Lynn and we'll uh, keep going. So thanks, Lynn. Appreciate okay. it. Thanks, yep. everyone. Thank you, Ben. All right. Goal three is to inform, educate, and involve the neighborhood in order to create and foster a landscaping and um, ethic and culture that values biodiversity. And we, we did a good bit of, of work under, under this particular um, goal. I put together a monthly newsletter called Go Native, Creating Your Eco-Friendly Home Landscape. Um, and that often it will include um, a, a native plant and how to grow it, or uh, it'll uh, feature an invasive plant and, and the ways to get rid of it. Um, Right now, I'm in the midst of a series of 10 things you can do uh, to increase, uh, to make your yard more eco-friendly. This is, uh, these 10 things are taken from Doug Tallamy's 10 things you can do to make your yard more bird friendly. Kind of same, same difference. Um, in this April issue, um, it talks about number three, which is build a landscape layered with plants. And what that means is to have a canopy layer an understory trees, um, the shrub layer, and an uh, herbaceous layer. So we hope le less grass, more, more native plants. And the, the Woodcroft board had a great idea. There is a, a letter that goes out about dues at the end of every year, and they suggested putting together um, a letter to go in with that to explain about this project. And, and this um, letter was similar to the to the flyer we did to people who uh, were having treatment 
done on common land near their house. Uh, the difference in this is it did uh, contain pictures of the most common invasive plants um, in Woodcroft. And this letter went out again just a couple of weeks ago with our um, information about our annual homeowners meeting that's coming up. We've done some consultations. Uh, this is Rob Bickley, a Woodcroft resident. Uh, I'm talking to her about uh, showing her what the native plants in her yard are and the invasive plants. Leslie and I um, also reviewed several arch architectural review board um, some plant landscape plan submissions. If people are doing um, a major landscape redo, uh, or not even made. If they're doing a big enough landscape uh, change, they need to submit uh, plans to the architectural review board. And I, I also consulted with a couple of homeowners associations who learned about uh, this work that we were doing. And this was our, education, our in, educational event for the neighborhood for the year called Moth Light Night. It was really fun. Um, People learned about the importance of moths and their caterpillars and insects in general. And I just want to point out this gorgeous flyer that one of our committee members, Sandy Washington, put together. And also, uh, just to thank at this point, um, the volunteers, the committee members who have, who have helped make all, all this work happen. So Steve Hall, uh, I bet many of you know Steve, uh, or have been to some of his presentations, was the wildlife ecologist who did Moth Night for us. Here he's uh, got his equipment and getting ready to set up. Um, and what he does is he, he has a black light that attracts the moths to this white sheet and, so that they can be um, really easily seen. And, oh, I was gonna say, here he's setting up along the Third Fork Creek Trail uh, during the uh, city or county trail, part of which runs through Woodcroft. And then here, he also set up um, across Woodcroft Parkway and behind the soccer fields next to a cattail marsh. So we've got two different, sort of two different areas. And Steve, Steve gave an, a, a really informative, entertaining, interesting presentation on the importance of moths and other insects. And, um, here you can see people taking a look at the sheet. Um, unfortunately, the con weather conditions were terrible for moths, and we didn't we didn't get as many nearly as many as we hoped. But it was I think people still had a wonderful time. Uh, and you can see in the bottom right a sign one of our committee members made. Uh, she's a high school student at Jordan High, and her mom is actually holding up one side of uh, the sign, and her mom is on our committee also. So here you see um, some of the attendees. We had 40 people of all ages, and, uh, and it was just a blast. Uh, Leslie held two um, native plant sales, one in the fall, one in the spring. This is another Sandy Washington poster here. And um, the other thing she did was to hold a sale of bird boxes from New Hope Audubon. So trying to, trying to get, get things out into people's yards. And, um, whoop, sorry. I, I think we're gonna take some more questions now. Is that right, Ben? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Lynn. We've got a lot of questions coming through, so we'll try to get to some more of these here before we keep on going. Um, Anne was asking <laughs> if you've got some help. <laughs> yeah, I do, I do. <laughs> uh, in a common area behind my house, I see bamboo growing. Uh, the HOA board has voted to leave it alone. Do you have any suggestions on how to approach that? How to approach getting rid of it or how to approach the board? Um, I think a little bit of both, maybe, if you could, if you could speak to that. Well, we know that bamboo is really, really hard to get rid of. Woodcroft has the same issue. Um, we've, we've got some bamboo. Um, we have not started to, I, I can't speak very uh, knowledgeably to that yet because we haven't started dealing with our bamboo. 
if, if that person would like to email me, I think we're going to have my email. I'd be glad to, to communicate and do some uh, research. Um, I think you can tell the HOA board, again, it's going to go and go and go. And pretty soon, you know, you're going to have a world of bamboo. Do they really, you know, imagine that 20 years from now and think about whether that's something they, they want this area to be. Yeah. That's Maybe it exciting. is. But, and I would also, again, tell them about the ecological effects of that and that, you know, people don't want to, um, you know, one of the, they're, well, one of the reasons, you know, there are many reasons that our board wanted to, uh, or several reasons our board wanted to do this project. You know, it's certainly because of the environmental issues, but um, it trashes your woodlands. You know, they didn't want people walking down our trails and being in a, you know, in a scary thicket of bamboo or whatever. Um, so, you know, there, there are a lot of reasons to think about trying to tackle it before it goes any further. Thanks, and I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and again, everyone, if I'm, we're not going to be able to get to everyone's questions, and we'll make sure to send out Lynn's email as well after this talk is over. I'm sure she'd be happy to address any. But here's one that comes in from Linda. She said, erosion is a huge issue here in Woodcroft and the other neighborhoods. If we get rid of the English ivy that appears to be helping some of the hilly places soil, keep that in place, do you have any suggestions for what might be planted in place of that? Well, you know, from what I understand, from what I read, English ivy's roots are very shallow and they're really not doing that much to hold that land anyway. We do have erosion problems that, because, uh, you know, the plants are gone that might have been along those streams. Um, Leslie's been interested, um, I, I'm interested too, but my focus has been more on invasive plants in this, in this first year. But, um, something certainly needs to be done, and the English ivy is is by far not the best solution to that. Great, thanks, Linda. We'll take. Let's do one more. Um, do you have any suggestions? Some folks are interested in learning of landscape maintenance companies or landscape design firms that have some credibility in native plants or drought tolerant plants, or maybe how how y'all went went searching for those or if you have any suggestions for people? I don't believe this is yet on the New Hope Audubon website, but we at New Hope Audubon have a list of uh, local landscapers and I, that's something I'd also be glad to send out if people will email me. I, I have, I, I'm pretty sure that's not on the website right now, but I'll be glad to email people that list that I have. Great. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, everyone. Keep the keep some questions coming. And uh, yeah, we'll try to get to some more. Actually, here, let's take I'm going to give you one more, Lynn, and then we'll and then we'll keep on moving. Um, do you have do you know if there's any resources for low income HOAs to transition landscape from invasive to native? Um, Aaron here is thinking about possible grants or pro bono services for this type of work. I don't off the top of my head, you know, we, since we're, an HOA is not a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization. So we can't actually apply for grants here in Woodcroft. I think we could probably partner with another entity. So I, I have looked into that just a little bit. I agree, especially for low-income neighborhoods who, who want to do this. Um, I would guess there are resources. And again, um, if I think it was Aaron will um, email me, I'd be glad to have a conversation about that and do some brainstorming outside of this, because uh, I was going to take a little research and some thinking. To, uh, to think about how to approach that. I think that's a great question. Great, thanks so much, Lynn, and thanks everyone for this lively discussion. I'll hand it back over to Lynn here. Okay. Um, well, our final goal is to inform, educate, and coordinate with Woodcroft boards, committees, and sub-HOAs. And actually, in this first year, uh, we mostly work with our Woodcroft Homeowners Association Board and with TR, our community manager, 
Uh, we hope in the future to reach out to other Woodcroft committees more and sub uh, the sub HOAs. All right, so what, uh, You've heard what the committee accomplished in the first year. What, what did the board uh, accomplish in the first year? Well, it was, it was just incredible. Um, the board mandated that 70% of plants in future Woodcroft Community Association landscaping will be native plants. They also mandated that no plants on the North Carolina invasive species list will heretofore be used in Woodcroft landscaping. Um, they allotted funds for a consultation with an expert um, last year, last summer, to just help us move this work forward. And Alan Johnson of Alan Johnson Landscaping toured Woodcroft with Leslie and me, offered so many helpful suggestions, actually came over and spoke uh, to the board at a meeting one night and helped us locate the treeist, who, as I said, is doing, um, doing the work uh, for the uh, invasive plant removal and the, they allotted the funds for that pri, uh, pilot project to start removing invasive plants on our common land. So kudos to the board. They've, they've been a great group to work with. Well what does Woodcroft gain uh, from addressing its ecological problems? Aesthetically beautiful and ecologically healthy lands. Uh, enhancement of our neighborhood's already positive reputation as a, as a really good place to live. Stable or we hope maybe even rising property values. Um, a stronger, more tightly knit community as we work together um, to build a healthier ecosystem. It's been a real pleasure to get some, to, I love the people in, in my little neighborhood, my little street, but I've gotten to know other people in other parts of the province. That's been, that's been a real pleasure. Um, good publicity, like this talk, for the community and its efforts. And finally, and I, I think most important, a community that supports the plants on which life depends. Well, um, you couldn't have a, a committee, you couldn't, you couldn't have a big project without having some challenges. And here are some of ours. Um, just the diff uh, difficulty in motivating residents to remove invasive plants, install natives, and adopt other eco-friendly practices. Um, we all know people are busy. Even the people who are completely on board with this have other things going on in their lives. And of course, there are some people who, who, who haven't tuned into this yet. I hope, I hope we can reach more people um, in the neighborhood. Um, getting property lines marked, it, it, was, it would cost a fortune to hire a, a surveyor. So for the pilot project, T.R. O'Neill, the community manager, has done that. Um, I hope we can find him some help. Uh, he's planning to continue to do that as we proceed. Um, if anybody out there uh, has some facility with GIS and would like to help out, I'd, I'd love to hear from you, and I bet T.R. would love it too. Um, Inventorying invasives on common lands. I did the inventory for um, the pilot project and I've got a couple of very knowledgeable people who are going to start helping me in August uh, to continue with the inventory on the other lands because of course you know we've got to know what we've got and where it is in order to uh, efficiently and cost effectively um, work with our company the Trius to uh, to get these things removed. Um, this goes back to that question earlier, communicating to residents that herbicides are really necessary if, if we're gonna remove these invasive plants. It's just not feasible. I mean, if we could get all of Woodcroft to come out and work like crazy people, it would still be really hard to dig up, pull up. Uh, I think herbicides in the beginning are necessary. I, I'm not a fan. I've gotten the same container of Roundup I've probably had 15 or 20 years. Uh, but for this, for this kind of use, I, I don't see a feasible way around using them. 
finding a company to remove invasives. Well, they're, you know, they're the small companies that focus on native plants and ecological landscaping that, that may do a little removal when they're helping somebody with their yard. And then there are big companies who might go in and remove invasives in a wetland and then restore the native plants to, to a wetland. Um, there aren't so many in that middle ground. Uh, so that took us a little while, but with Alan's help, uh, as I said, we came up with the Triest out of Carborough and have had just a great working relationship with them. Building a functioning committee. Uh, we had nine people at our first meeting. You know, we have five, six, seven, eight, nine people, 10 people at committee meetings now. And they've done great work and been invaluable with their thoughts and suggestions. But the more people we've got, the more we can do. So it would be really wonderful to have um, to have more uh, volunteers and committee members. And finally, the pandemic has, as it has in all our lives in so many ways, thrown a monkey wrench into this project. You know, some things I'm saying we're gonna do, this is, uh, you know, we've lost two and a half or three months because of the pandemic. All right. So, um, the documents, that I've mentioned in this talk are also posted, I think you've received them already. For those of you who wanna start educating your homeowners association uh, board or your neighborhood association. And I hope you'll look at, um, there's one handout especially that contains a lot of resources and tips. And that'll help you, uh, if you're not already familiar with a lot of these concepts and resources, it'll help you learn more and enable you um, to do more to increase biodiversity. So, so what can you do? Well, well I've, got some, I've got some suggestions for you. You can make your yard more eco-friendly. Consider, say before the end of the year, fall is a great time to plant. Plant a native plant or remove uh, some invasive plants or one or more from your yard. With all this rain we've had, it's a, it's a great time. I've, I've got some little residual periwinkle that um, I'm out pulling up now because it, man, it just slides out of the ground <laughs> when, it's, when it's soggy. Encourage others to adopt eco-friendly practices. Talk to your friends, your neighbors, share these documents, do what you can to let them know how important this this particular issue is, as I've said, you know, people, people know about climate change and this, in, to my mind and, and to the minds of people who are more scientifically trained than I am, this, this is a real biggie too. Um, if you live in a neighborhood with an HOA, start to educate your board. And as I said, you've got the documents, I'm glad uh, and I'm sure Leslie would be too, to talk to you in more in depth about what we're doing and uh, how we're doing it. And finally, lobby your local government officials to adopt eco-friendly uh, practices in your city and county. If you live in Durham County, right now, uh, the city and county governments are working on a new comprehensive plan. Uh, last fall and this spring, they've been taking uh, input from citizens. This is a great time. I, I know you've got other things going on and they do, but it's so important to, to contact your city and county officials in Durham and let them know that in this comprehensive plan, you really want to see uh, some attention on this issue um, about biodiversity. So I think we're going to have one more poll here now. Ben's, Ben's coming back. Yeah, let's do, we're going to do one more poll here. So if y'all could, I'm going to launch it right now. Talking about which of the following will you try to do by the end of 2020? And here are some choices. So we'll take 30 seconds or so, and then we'll, we'll share this out. So we've got plant a native plant, remove an invasive plant, encourage others to adopt eco-friendly practices. If you live in a neighborhood with an HOA, excuse the typo there, <laughs> or neighborhood association, begin to educate. 
uh, lobby local government officials to adopt eco-friendly practices in the city and county or none of the above. Excuse my typos there in the poll. All right, we've got about 80% voted. 83, a few more votes coming in. Give it five more seconds. All right, let's see what we've got. Sharing the results out. Wow, this is great. So people were able to vote multiple times, but it looks like plant, plant native plants, remove invasives, and encourage others to adopt eco-friendly practices are on the top of people's list for things that they want to try to do by the end of this year. That's incredible, guys. I, I, I hope you'll follow through. And uh, because as you know, um, this, this is important. Um, as, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, Woodcroft is a pioneer in this work. And I hope, and it, and it looks like from this poll that you are thinking about also taking up this cause and helping spread the word in, in one or more ways. Um, we, we haven't been very kind to the earth for um, a while now, and it, it's, it's, it's time or past time to change that. Uh, the lives of all our de uh, descendants depend on it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Lynn. We are, look at that, exactly at one o'clock. Um, <laughs> you timed that perfectly. Uh, so thank you. I know there's people have a lot more questions on this topic. Sure. Um, so I think I'm going to send out to everyone Lynn's email um, along with those documents. Once again, some folks said they didn't come through. So I'm going to make sure that everyone gets those documents. I know Lynn is incredibly passionate about this and would, you know, love to love to talk with people about her experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't want to keep people here. I want to be respectful of Lynn's time and everyone else's time. So thank you all so very much. Thank you to Lynn so much for sharing her time and expertise on this and, and sharing this project. Um, really interesting, fascinating work. Um, and yeah, hopefully this sparks a, a lot of discussion. I know in the chat box and the questions, people, people were already chatting with each other about things that you were bringing up. So I think this is a wonderful way to to start this conversation in other HOA as neighborhood associations. So yeah, I just, yeah, I want to say again, please contact me. I'll be happy to have a conversation with you um, and, and, and look forward to, to that. That's great. Well, thank you everyone so very much. Uh, we're going to, we're going to log off here. And again, this was recorded. So uh, once we get this edited a little bit, we will post it on our YouTube channel. And again, I'll be able to send that link out to everyone should be tomorrow or Monday um, that I'll get that link to everyone um, along with Lynn's email um, and some other resources. So again, thank you very much and hope everyone enjoys the rest of their week.